Welcome back to Over My Dead Pod, a true crime podcast brought to you by me, Kylie Colwell. It is I, Kate Carter. And me, Holly Spear. Today, I'm going to tell you guys the infamous case of Bundy. Kate has left the building. You literally told me I might not know this one. And I was so before we started recording, I was like, Kylie, do it. Am I going to know this one? And she was like, you might. And I asked her what region. And she was like, it's California ish. And I was like, if it's a serial killer, I'll know it. Obviously. Were you trying to throw us off? Ser- it was the number one serial killer. I have another plot twist because we're not talking about that Bundy. Today, I'm going to tell you the story of <laughs> Carol Bundy and her boyfriend, Doug Clark, a couple who loved murder more than they loved each other, also known as the Sunset Strip Killers. Wait, excuse me. We're not doing Ted Bundy? No. Nope. You tr- you done tricked us. I tricked you twice. Oh, my God. My heart rate is all over the place right now. Okay. I know Ted Bundy like the back of my hand. I do not know these Bundys. Different Bundy, apparently no relation. Ted Bundy did have a girlfriend named Carol, but it is not this Carol Bundy. Your Um, your cat Bundy is shaking right now. (laughs) Yes. There's so many Bundy. For those who don't know, Kylie has a little cat named Bundy. Or Bun Bun. Or Bun Buns. Um, I'm just going to go ahead. Blanket trigger warning, because if you can name it, it's in this episode. Everything. So we're going to start off. Also, this is our first female serial killer. Very rare, but it happens very rare. And usually they're horrific. You'll learn mm. a lot about Miss Carol. Uh, mm. Carol Bundy was born Carol Peters to two abusive and alcoholic parents, Charles and Gladys. Basically, entire childhood was just full of emotional and physical abuse. When Carol was 11, her mother passed away. Literally, as soon as her dad got back from the hospital, he walked into the house, get this, turned to Carol and her sister and said, now that my wife is dead, you two have to take your mother's place in my bed. What? Ew. What? Mm. Like, very ew. So the sexual abuse at the hands of their father continued for about eight months until he found a replacement, aka a new wife. But immediately after the wedding ceremony, Charles put Carol and her sister into foster homes. So most likely due to the abuse and abandonment as a child, Carol was very, very sexually promiscuous even allegedly with her school bus driver. And at 17, Carol met a man named Leonard, who was 56, and they got married. Okay, so there's just issues with the story, like, from the beginning. From the very, very beginning. So this is sad. This is going to be a sad story. For a multitude of reasons. Leonard would sell Carol out to other men for money. But Carol ended up running away from Leonard and she befriended a man named Richard Geis or Geese, I'm not really sure. And he was a pornography writer, apparently very famous. This Porn is- was in books. Yes. But the two really hit it off as friends. I'm not certain if they had any other sort of relationship outside of friends. Not entirely sure. But the two began writing together and apparently Carol was a good writer and actually helped write some of these books. When Richard discovered that Carol had been sleeping with men for money during this time, he offered to pay for Carol's nursing school so she could have a better life. And in 1968, Carol actually graduated from her nursing school as valedictorian. She soon began working as a nurse at Valley Medical Center, which is a little bit outside of LA, where she met a man named Grant Bundy. This is where we get the Bundy name. He was a fellow nurse and the two soon got married. So like many of the men before, Grant was abusive. And it wasn't until bringing home a second son, Carol worked up the courage to leave Grant and she made her way to a shelter for battered women. Pretty soon after she got back up on her feet and she found an apartment for her and her two sons at the Valerio Gardens apartment house run by a man named Jack Murray. And Jack's Australian. All right, Jack Murray. So Carol was downright obsessed with Jack. She would follow him around the apartment complex, have him like drive her around to things. Jack was also a singer, a little Elvis wannabe, and he would play and sing at local bars and stuff and lounges. Um, Carol was at every single one of his shows, but Jack was a married man, but that didn't stop the two. They did have an affair. Carol was convinced that Jack loved her and Carol tried to pay off his wife to leave Jack. That didn't work out. Jack never left his marriage. 
and his wife convinced him to evict Carol. But even though she was no longer living in the same apartment complex, Carol continued to go to Jack's shows. And it was at one of these shows, Christmas ish time, 1979, at a bar called Little Nashville, where she met a man named Doug Clark, who was well known in the area for leeching onto older women for money and leaving them to dry. I I found some quotes like his friends say that he had a type for older, fat, ugly women. I will say the Uh, picture that you have with him right now, he's wearing a military uniform. Oh, yeah, we're going to get into that. Okay. So Doug had basically a complete opposite childhood from Carol. He was from a very wealthy family of naval intelligence officers. And as a child, lived in upwards of 37 different countries. When he was young, he went to a very prestigious school in Geneva, Switzerland called Equant. And this is where like diplomat children, celebrities, royalty went. But Doug was not a good student, and he was eventually expelled for consistently showing up drunk, stealing things, and writing an erotic letter to one of his teachers. Classmates of Doug said that he was always bragging about his sexual escapades and just being like outright obnoxious. So Doug's parents decided to send him to Culver Military Academy to get his shit together. But they basically just dropped him off. They visited him once and then just kept traveling and moving around. Doug's sexual behavior got worse and worse. He would record women while they were having sex, like audio tapes and Just anytime he was around people, he would just start playing them. Mm, Okay. So he was weird. Very weird guy. But he did end up graduating from Culver and he enlisted in the Air Force. And he was stationed in Anchorage where he was tasked with decoding Russian messages. So he was there for a bit. He received an honorable discharge and a National Defense Service Medal. I don't know if that's like a big medal or what. I mean, uh, any medal should be a big deal, you know? That's true. It's not a participation trophy, so it's good. Right. So after his discharge, he decided he was going to drive from Alaska to Mexico to start his life. But on the way to Mexico, he stopped in L.A. to visit his sister, and he never left. And this is when he meets Miss Carol. So pretty soon after meeting the two. (laughs) Kylie just put up the pictures of Carol and Doug, and goodness gracious, isn't that scary? (laughs) Oh, man. He's a creepy looking dude. That's a scary looking guy. So within a couple weeks of meeting, Doug moved into Carol's apartment with her two sons. And just as quickly, Doug began bringing home prostitutes for the two to have threesomes with. Carol was apparently very into this. She was most likely bisexual. And her and Doug shared many of the same sexual fantasies. So they just really hit it off. But things started getting weird when Doug started talking about someone in the apartment complex that he had an interest in. 11 year old girl that carol babysat no so carol lured the young girl into their apartment and made her pose for certain photographs Mm. before you know doug did certain things to this young girl but this wasn't enough for doug and he expressed that his true desire was to kill a girl during sex and feel their body die while he was inside of them Okay. Uh, Anything with children is not a good feeling, but then, yeah. yeah. But Doug convinced Carol to buy him two pistols, and they are called the Raven, for whatever reason. Doug also convinced Carol to buy him a new car, and one night when Carol went to the car, she found bullet holes all on the inside of the passenger door. She confronted Doug, and he said when he was cleaning the gun, it, you know, accidentally discharged because, you know, you clean your guns in your car. Mm -hmm. Uh, and they always accidentally discharge every single time carol didn't believe him and the very next day she transferred custody of her sons back to her ex-husband grant but sad story grant the very next day after that sent the kids to go live with his parents so they just got bounced around bounced around okay not good people on June 11th of 1980, Doug came home and told Carol about two young girls he encountered named Gina Marina and Cynthia Chandler, two stepsisters who hitchhiked their way to L.A. from Huntington Beach at 15 and 16 years old. Doug told Carol that he picked up Gina and Cynthia on the Sunset Strip, and that's like, you know, the famous L.A., yeah. all the billboards, whatever. He picked them up, and as they were performing oral sex on him, he shot them both in the head. 
Doug continued by saying that he dumped their bodies off the Ventura freeway. The next day, the bodies of Gina and Cynthia were found by workers picking up trash right where Doug said they would be. Cynthia was wearing a pink jumpsuit that had been wrapped around her legs, and the inseam was cut all the way up. There was blood and grease covering the jumpsuit. Gina was only wearing a red tube top that had been pulled down, and both girls had been sexually assaulted and shot twice. So Carol did feel a little guilty. She anonymously called the police, saying she knew some information about Gina and Cynthia's death. She told police information no one knew, including the fact that Gina was shot in the head and the heart, and the gun had been placed against her chest when it was fired. Carol also revealed that Cynthia was shot twice in the head and that a Raven pistol had been used. So when police asked, you know, who did it, Carol said she knows who, but then she hung up. On June 23rd at 2.15 a.m., an officer patrolling Sunset Boulevard ran into a known sex worker named Karen Jones, and the officer warned Karen not to loiter in the area. By 2.30 a.m., a resident in the area heard a shrieking scream outside of his home, and by 3.15 a.m., Karen's body was found lying in a pool of blood on the curb. Karen Jones had been shot by, you guessed it, the same Raven pistol used in the murders of Gina and Cynthia. That same day, at 7.15 a.m., the body of a decapitated girl was found in a restaurant parking lot by the dumpsters. The body belonged to a young girl named Exy Wilson, a prostitute originally from Little Rock, Arkansas. So what we now know is that Doug lured both Karen and Exie into his car to solicit them for sex, but the girls didn't know that Carol was crouching down in the back seat holding the gun. She was a part of it. She was a part, but I guess she wasn't quite ready because apparently Carol was too scared to pull the trigger. So Doug pulled the gun out of Carol's hand and shot them both, somehow removed Exie's head. And the two then drove around town, dropping their bodies off. But they kept the head and put it in their fridge. Carol later confessed to putting makeup on the head so that Doug could use it for, you know what? So Mm -hmm. Carol later told investigators, quote, where I had my fun was with the makeup. I was making her over like a little Barbie doll. So two days after this murder, Carol and Doug cleaned the head. They placed it in a pine box and threw it into an alley. And it wasn't until a couple more days, a man found the box, discovered the head, which was wrapped in blue jeans and a t-shirt that said, Daddy's Girl. Remember this t-shirt because it'll come back. So at this point, the LAPD realized they had a serial killer on their hands. And little fun fact, to investigate, they formed California's first ever all-female detective team. Okay. It was led by Helen Kidder and Peggy York. But Helen and Peggy couldn't rest long because three days after Exie's head was found, the body of 17-year-old Marnette Comer was found in the woods of the San Fernando Valley. Marnette, like the others, was a prostitute and also a runaway. Marnette was found by hunters in an autopsy showed that she had been dead anywhere from 20 to 40 days, making her probably the first known victim. And I'm guessing this was probably the victim that resulted in the bullet holes in the car. Uh, Marnette had been shot three times by a Raven pistol. So Marnette was actually had been reported missing by her sister pretty soon after she had disappeared. And her sister told police she last saw her wearing blue jeans and a t-shirt that said daddy's girl. Mm -hmm. On July 25th, a young woman was found shot in the head on Sunset Boulevard. She still remains unidentified as Jane Doe number 18. Two weeks later, hikers found another woman who had been shot in the head, and she too remains unidentified and is known as Jane Doe number 99. So both of these women's bodies were like completely decayed into skeletons almost, but the coroner did locate a bullet in each of their skulls, which had been fired by a Raven pistol. Okay, do you guys remember Mr. Jack Murray, the Australian singer? Jack Murray. (laughs) While all of this is going down. Yeah, what's Jack doing? Carol is still sleeping with Jack. He's Carol's married, sleeping. right? And she tried he's, to pay off his wife? Yep. And mm-hmm. she's, you know, she's doing crimes with Doug. And she's still going to all of his shows. So one night in August of 1980, Carol went to go see Jack perform like she had been doing. And the two started drinking together after the show. And I guess Carol had a little bit too much to drink because she started to tell Jack everything that her and Doug had been doing. So Jack obviously went to like call the police. 
But I don't know if he also had too much to drink because then he got into his van with Carol so the two could have adult relations after he just found out she'd been killing people. I also would like to say, looking at a picture of Carol and looking at a picture of Jack Murray, I wouldn't have pegged the two together. Yeah. Yeah. Jack's kind of cute. He's a cutie patootie. Look at those eyebrows and the nose. You know, I love a nose. Love a nose. Love him. Love okay, him. cool. I've, you know, what? 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 Why is on she getting no, a Spider-Man? On her elbow because she loves Spider-Man. Oh, so she's doing the spider web on the elbow. No. Oh, that's bad. No. And, oh, bad. Uh, no, so yeah, bad. Obviously, we'll cut all this out, but that's a very trashy tattoo. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Thank it, God it for you for telling her the truth. Yeah. She'll I'm probably so still bad. get it. I tried telling her. Anyways. Okay. Continue on. Oh. Sorry about that. Okay. So while Carol and Jack were having sex carol shot stabbed and decapitated jack all on her own she then left his body in the van leaving it parked on the side of the road in a random neighborhood she then took jack's head home where doug threw it in the trash so so jack murray is done jack murray's done dead and get this his head has never been found really that's mm-hmm. so sad. Yeah, that is really sad. But then again, he knew all of this information and still continued to sleep with Carol. It's very Maybe weird. Maybe he thought she was just like saying something being drunk. Not that that's something that you say when you're drunk, <laughs> when you're but, drunk. but like, oh, I don't know. He was just. Well, that's really sad. Very Ugh. eager. I don't know. His body wouldn't be found until about nine days later after people began complaining about a foul odor coming from the van parked on the street. Mm. So Jack's death was investigated entirely separate because, you know, he was a man, wasn't linked to the string of prostitutes being found around. So police began talking to customers at the bar that night who reported seeing Carol with Jack and the two leaving together. So Carol was brought in for questioning and she told police that she was with, um, not Jack that night, but with Doug, and that people that saw her must have been mistaken. But Carol got spooked. She returned home, and she told Doug to get rid of the guns. Um, Doug was not happy with Carol. At this point, he's over her bullshit. She's being messy. Um, He knew that she left shell casings behind in the van. She thought she was being smart bringing the head home. Doug's mad he's cleaning up Carol's mess. So Doug told Carol he was leaving her. And he was moving out. So Carol started full-blown panic. Um, She thought by killing Jack, the two would be closer together. You know, she could prove herself. Whatever. So Carol called good old friend Richard Geis, the porn writer, to see if she could come live with him in Portland. Uh, Richard declined. Obviously. (laughs) So for good reason. The next morning, Carol dropped Doug off back at work. And headed in for her shift at the hospital like nothing had happened. But at this point, Carol became completely unraveled. And in the break room, she told a fellow nurse and her supervisor about all of the murders. Oh, so this is public knowledge. She's just confessing to everybody. Okay. Um, At one point, she said, quote, I can't take it anymore. I'm supposed to save lives, not take them. So her coworkers obviously did the right thing. They called the police, but Carol slipped out through the hospital basement and went to Doug's work at the Jurgen Soap Factory. Carol told Doug that she was going to turn himself in and she was going to give him all of her money so that he could run away. So Carol then headed home where she was going to change clothes, I guess, and do her makeup and hair to turn herself into prison normal thing to do but while carol was heading back to the house doug called the police himself and said that carol was in charge of all of it that she was responsible for all of the murders that was gonna happen so while carol was doing her hair midway police showed up to arrest her do we have a mug shot because i want to see her half hair done (laughs) i couldn't find any mug shots um Doug's not a ride or die. No, at all. He he was like, screw that. Um, Carol confessed 
obviously immediately. She even screamed out confessions over the police attempting to Mirandize her. But Carol came with the receipts. She brought with her to the station underwear from one of the victims and the photographs of the 11-year-old girl. She also told police where they find even more evidence, including where the pistols were, which Doug hid behind some loose bricks at the Jurgens factory. And she gave police keys to a storage unit Doug rented, where Doug kept his bloody shoes. And there's also DNA found that belonged to Cindy and Gina. So right behind Carol, Doug was also arrested. Doug was charged with six murders, Marnette, Comer, Karen Jones, Exie Wilson, Gina Marina, Cynthia Chandler, and Jane Doe, number 99. Carol was charged with the murder of Jack Murray and Jane Doe, number 18. I'm not exactly sure how they decided, why they decided to break up the two Jane Does. I don't know. But um, once, you know, news got out that Doug had been arrested, a woman named Charlene A., came forward, identifying Doug as a man who attacked her back in April. Charlene had previously reported to police that one night while out working as a prostitute, Doug approached her, and when she got in his car, he began stabbing her. At one point, Charlene was able to grab the knife, to which she said, you're hurting me, and Doug responded, I know, and began laughing. But Charlene was able to escape. (laughs) So Carol made a deal with the prosecution in order to like testify against Doug and she was given immunity for the murders of the six women Doug was charged with. Carol was ultimately sentenced to 25 years for Jack's murder and 27 years for the murder of Jane Doe number 18. Doug at trial decided to represent himself, which is always a great move. Always a good one. Yeah. <laughs> always works out. And he tried to convince the jury that the real killers were in fact Carol and Jack. But they don't work out for him. He was sentenced to death in 1983. Pillars love testifying. They really do. They love getting up on the stand. Red they flag. Can't, they can't shut up. You really shouldn't even go on stand, you know, like that. Wow. No, but they love it. They love it. Yeah. They love the attention. So Doug and Carol continued to write to each other while they were imprisoned. Somehow. I didn't know you could write between prisons, but apparently you could back in the day. But Carol died from heart failure in 2003. Doug remains on death row to this day. So I want to talk a little before we play the blame game. <laughs> There's this book by Louise Farr. Um, she interviewed both of them while they were in prison, wrote this great book about it. Um, so I want to share some quotes she gave about the two and then ask what we thought or what we think. So for Carol, Louise said, Carol was terribly abused by her father as a child. Because of that, she became subservient. She would do anything to please her man, and she lost any boundaries. Carol Bundy seemed to be motivated by a true sociopathy, as well as a desire to manipulate people. She wouldn't talk to me unless I bought her a typewriter. She wanted respect. Carol was cold, dark, unsympathetic, cowardly, yet refined and clever. And as for Doug, Louise said he was essentially a leech. He wanted attention. When he was in county jail, there were a lot of serial killers inside, like the Hillside Strangler, and Doug was miffed because he wasn't getting as much attention as the others. So who, I don't know, I'm leaning towards Doug was kind of in charge. What do we think? Okay, so you guys both think Doug was the in charge one. The ringleader. Yeah, I do not. I think it's the opposite. You think it's Carol? I think she, I think Carol might be like the power move. Like she, I mean, don't get me wrong. Doug is messed up as well, Mm -hmm. but I feel like she probably had a lot more to do with the deaths that he got charged with than him pulling. I mean, they're, I don't know. They're both horrible people, but I feel like her background, she's a really smart cookie. So like, Mm -hmm. you know, she was valedictorian and everything. I feel like she could have used, used Doug. She kind of, yeah. Yeah, I could see that. I feel like Doug or she was manipulated by Doug, you know? Doug had this creepy behavior since day one. I feel like he would have ended up doing this with or without Carol. I'm sure Carol had some similar fantasies. Yeah. But if she hadn't met Doug, I don't think she would have done it. 
Yeah, I, think I she agree. just would have done think- whatever man she was with was doing. Yeah, yeah I think I true. think they're just playing off of each other. I think maybe without him, she wouldn't have done it, and vice versa. I think it would have been different. I think he would have done it without her. But then I think she got so into it when she would like did it on her own and brought the head back to him. That was like, oh, look at what I did, you know, like yeah. pleasing like, him. Stupid. You left yeah. all the evidence, you know. Yeah. Interesting. And with that. That it's a story of the Sunset Strip Killers. Very nice, Kylie. Very Good nice, Vanessa. Far and all. I love I've love. i never the, heard that one. The loop you threw us in. Because I was, as soon yeah. as Ned Bundy's face went up on the screen, I, I walked away from my computer. I was like, what is this girl doing? And then you were like, just kidding. It's the other Bundys. The other Bundys. That was good. I had never heard of that one. Same. Very nice. Finesse, finesse. Finesse. All right, Kylie, you want to jump into overtime? Yes, I welcome back. Start us off, Kylie. Sorry. All right. Let's get into some overtime. I have breaking news fresh from Twitter. Oh, one of my favorite topics Scientology. Oh, so apparently, you know, the leader, David Miscavige, has Mm -hmm. been or there's a civil suit going on involving child trafficking um, from past victims who are now older. So no criminal charges. Um, apparently they have been trying to serve him for the past four months. They tried to serve him over 27 times. They've gone to every single Scientology owned property and they have yet to be able to do so. So now um, our good, good friend, Leah Remini mm. is trying to track him down. Mm-hmm. Go Leah. So he's avoiding avoiding arrest mm-hmm. at the moment. Yeah. And they have photos of like the process server like dropping the papers off, like with security and stuff. Like he definitely has them, the man's hiding. Yeah. He's why well, wouldn't you be? You know? Exactly. That is crazy. But I just hope I live long enough to see him go down. Okay. He's so small. Everybody go look up David Miscavige. He is a, he's he's exactly what you would think he'd look like. He's a small man energy looking person. Little little dick syndrome. Little 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 man syndrome. syndrome. Yeah. So, okay, I'll go next. Um, So this is just an update for, this actually happened in 2019 in Dominican. So one of um, the Baseball Hall of Fame uh player david ortiz he's also known as big poppy in 2019 a video circulated the internet one day i think it popped up with the news headline too and it shows um david ortiz sitting outside of a cafe in the dominican with a friend and out of nowhere you see this motorcycle come up and someone gets off the motorcycle shoots david ortiz very close very like close range um right in the back through the chest and then runs off. Well, it has been obviously three years since this has happened. And the Dominican court this past week has convicted 10 people involved in the 2019 attempted killing. Um, and something that was kind of cool about not cool, but amazing. First of all, big poppy did not die. He actually got up from the scene. And if, if you don't know who he is, this is a very big man he is i mean his nickname is big poppy go look at a picture of him he's massive so they actually said that his height and weight helped with the shooting because it wasn't able to penetrate and do actual damage to his arteries but anyways so 10 people have been convicted two men who were in charge of the actual shooting were both sentenced to 30 years in prison um again this is the dominican and this was an attempted killing so obviously it's going to be trialed and charged a little bit differently than it would in the u.s um but i just wanted to let you guys have some updates on that and i think more sentencing is going to be coming out in february for this specific case but um from what i know david ortiz he's still he's fine um he did have to have surgery to remove his gallbladder i believe but then after that he ended up okay so that's just a little update from that shooting from 2019. Shout out, Big Poppy. Holly, you got anything for us tonight? Yes, ma'am. Um, okay, so 
The one that I have is something that I found today. Um, it happened on December 30th. I'm trying to pull it up here. Let's see. Like yesterday? Yeah. Like wow. yesterday. Sorry, hold on. Where did it go? Okay, so um, another Pennsylvania incident here. Um, the, a Pennsylvania man allegedly shot and killed his wife on Christmas Eve. Then he calls his dad and says that it was a suicide. Um, he's 35 years old um, from Pennsylvania, and he's accused of killing his wife after an argument. Um, they found a blood-stained letter left inside of his house uh, where his wife was just found deceased. The police showed up and found him sitting in his car outside in the garage, and they noticed that he had blood on his head and there was a pistol nearby. Um, inside, they found his wife, 39 years old, dead in an upstairs bedroom. Um, he claimed that she had committed suicide after an argument that they had. Um, the letter was really weird that she wrote. I'm not sure uh, at who wrote it at this point, but oh, well, probably him. Um, he, after all this happened, he called his father in Florida and told him that his wife had shot herself. Um, so he's now being charged with the murder. They believe that um, it was him. They were police were responding to a welfare check and they also smelled alcohol on him when they arrived. So that just happened. Um, we'll follow that case, but it was likely from what police are saying, they kind of are pretty sure that it's him. Do you mind um, have their names? Yeah, sorry. It is um, kind of hard to pronounce, but his name is Christopher Colbert and her name is Tamaria. Tamaria. Yeah. Yep. Oh so it's always the husband. Mm -hmm. It's always the husband. And, and while searching for this, I didn't do this one um, because I thought that it was kind of old. But while when researching something to talk about, I found a case that I didn't know about. Um, and so, and I think it's ongoing right now because they're still searching for the boyfriend. But in September of this year, police uh, responded to a welfare check where they found the body of a 22 year old woman who had been stuffed into two suitcases in her home. So that's one that was, I mean, September is not that, wasn't that far, far this away. So, awesome. Yep. Mm. In Brooklyn, in Brooklyn. Oh, you know what? I think I heard about that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think they're and still they're searching for him on it, right? Yeah. Yeah, they're still searching for the boyfriend. Um, I think obviously they think it was him. I'm not sure why I didn't read all of it, but I just thought that was pretty interesting. Why is it always a suitcase? What is it? I don't understand. No, they have I wheels. Don't I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. Because was, is there a, um, this could have been a completely different crime, but I know it was in New York somewhere and it looked like it was in the city. So I'm not sure if it's the same one, but it had a video of a man wheeling a suitcase and they were like in that suitcase was the body of his girlfriend or something like that. But this could have I been- I know what you're talking about. Yeah. I, I know what you're talking about. I think it's different, but that's what I mean. Like why- A body in a suitcase and he's just walking in on the street. Yeah. It was like on a- um one of the luggage carts and it yes. was something like that. Yeah. I know what you're talking mm -hmm. about. Yeah. No, this one was in the apartment. Um, and I think that they asked for a welfare check on the girl because they had residents around the apartment had smelled a foul odor. So yeah, and very interesting. I can't imagine. Yeah. You, I will say, I mean, not comparable in any type of way, but, um, I never regained my sense of smell from COVID. It's always been different. And mm -hmm. for a lot of people who did lose their smell and haven't recovered it, a lot of things smell, um, what they say is like rotting flesh. And so every once in a while I get a whiff of something that makes me sick to my stomach. Cannot imagine being a neighbor and feel and smelling something from a different unit. And immediately you would know how mm -hmm. awful that smell is. 
what about the, what about if you were in a hotel and you were drinking the water and the water Mm. tasted funny and was a weird color. And then you realized that there was a woman in the water tank, Lisa Lou. Oh, would never be able to sleep again. I would too. I, for sure. I don't know. I mean, I, I just couldn't, I don't know what I would have to do. I, Oh, I can't. Lots of them. I'm getting sick right now. I'm thinking about water. water. (laughs) Hey, while I have you guys, I'm cutting this out, but I just, just now, and it's on new sites. So, um, found out that how they caught Brian Kohlberger. I'm sorry. I can't quit talking about it, but I just, I just saw this. Like it just came up. He, um, was caught using, uh, genetic familial dna Mm. so is he right okay so no no here's what happened i was like looking at it and i kept thinking like he's got no criminal record so obviously there's probably his dna in the house but they're not gonna be able to match it to him unless they have a warrant for his dna so um apparently ran the dna Um, and like we see in a bunch of other cases happening right now, they found him through a genetic match of his. So obviously someone in his family had been arrested or his DNA was in CODIS, um, from a felony or what have you. And that's how they found him. And obviously the white Hyundai Elantra was something we don't know why that was significant, but obviously it was so. Yeah. I'm going to go ahead and say with the car, there had to have been footage at some point that we don't know about. Yeah. Yeah. They released some footage of the car. I did see that. I wasn't sure if it was reliable, but it was like a Hyundai Elantra like drove up and like took a security camera off of a building. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, that's, that's huge. (laughs) Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, Wow. Okay. Kylie closes out. Yeah. And with that, I need to start over because I forgot what I was going to say. And with that, that was Over My Dead Pod. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.